In today's lesson, we are going to be looking at the uses and misuses of data. So just as a little bit of a warm up, I want you to search for the following videos. You can find them on YouTube um, just to kind of look and think about how the same data can be get, can give different conclusions. Right? So the actual lengths will be three videos. So how statistics can be misleading, unmasking the hidden paradox in data, and how to spot a misleading graph. They're all relatively short, about five minutes or so. So just take a second to go find them um, and, re and watch through them just so you get an idea of kind of what we're going to be looking at today. From there, a little bit of a warm up. I want you to take a look at each graph and think about which statement is true. It's all going to be the same graph, but think about which statement is true. Huge drop in unemployment in Canada in spring. Moderate drop in, in unemployment in Canada in spring. Unemployment in Canada stays steady through the spring. So three different options with so three different things to look at. Right? So I'll go back A, B, or C. Right? So it's all looking at the same data, just represented a little bit different. So think about which statement you think makes sense which statement you think is true. The next one, Aboriginal homicide victims are nearly six times higher than expected. Aboriginal homicide victims are a low percentage of the total. So only two options there, sorry. So A and B, so six times higher than expected or a low percentage of the total. Huge spike in home runs in MLB in 37 years. Steady increase in home run rate in MLB in 37 years. Or home run, home run surge, nothing special. Right, so again, different things, to, different representations of the graphs, different things to think about when trying to figure out which statement makes sense. Right, so again, that's just a little bit more of a warm up, kind of we getting into what we've um, what some of the videos touched on, kind of how we can use or misuse data. So with that, with using and misusing data, some things that you might see in reports or in studies, you might see something um, with a margin of error and confidence levels. So the following statement says, in September of 2016, the Canadian Payroll Association published results from their annual survey of employed Canadians. In a survey of 5,600 people, from across the country, 24% said that they'd be unable to come up with $2,000 if an emergency arose in the next month. They reported that their findings have a margin of error of plus or minus 1.3%, 19 times out of 20. So what does that statement mean? What does that statement um, or this statement in general mean? Right. So a couple things to look at. The 19 times out of 20. So that's basically saying, if you repeat, let me change this so it looks a little nice. So if you repeat the study 19 or 20 times in 19, them what so the last part 19 times out of 20 means if we're repeating this the study 20 times in 19 of them what would we expect to happen we're saying the results the results will be somewhere between plus or minus 1.3% and their answer, their value was 24%. So they were saying 24% said they'd be able to, unable to come up with $2,000. So it's going to, 19 times out of 20, their value or their value that you're going to find is going to be 24% plus or minus 1.3. So the results will be somewhere between 24% and either 25.3% or 
22.7%. Right, because it's either going to be minus 1.3 or plus 1.3. So basically the statement's saying if you're repeating the study 20 times, in 19 of them your values are going to fall somewhere between 22.7 and 25.3%. Looking at the next statement, so in May of 2017, the results of an online poll of 1,517 Canadian adults were released about purchase, purchasing tickets to live events like concerts. They asked the question, please indicate whether you are for or against, make it legal to use bots to purchase tickets, and punish offenders with fines or jail time. They reported that 81% of the responses respondents supported the statement with a margin of error of plus or minus 2.5%. So what does this statement mean? Again, it doesn't really, we can have to look a little bit at this statement as well, or the graphic, but it does say 19 times out of 20 again. So we see that value come up or that statement come up. We also see what they found, 81% of the respondents supported, and there's a margin of error of plus or minus 2.5. So very similar to the last one, basically the results will be between 78.5% and 83.5% right, because it's plus or minus from what they found. So plus 2.5, minus 2.5. So plus or minus, so the result will be between 78.5% and 83.5%, 19 times out of 20. So this is kind of, involving that idea of uh, reliability that we talked about earlier and the fact that if you repeat this trials or this this experiment or this study over and over again are you going to get the same results and they're saying 19 times out of 20 which so relatively high i think you're looking at um 90 or 95 percent chance that it, the values are going to fall relatively close to what you're looking at Right. Again, you're not going to find the exact value every single time because everyone's different, right? But the idea is that you should become relatively close. So these statements in these studies, what they're actually doing is they're basically saying how certain or how confident they are in their study's reliability. Right. So by definition, the confidence intervals and the margin of error, basically the, inter the definition is the interval that was created from the margin of error statement. Right, so the interval is that range of values that we talked about or that we mentioned. The range of values. And the margin of error statement was basically the statement where it was plus or minus a, cer a certain percent. Right, so basically that was their margin of error. And when referring to some of the statements of 19 times out of 20 and so on, that's basically just referring to the confidence interval. Basically, how confident are they that this is going to occur, right? So they're 90% confident, they say nine out of 10 times. 19 out of 20, they're saying they're 95% confident. 99 out of 100 times, they're saying they're 99% confident. Right? So just different um, statements, different values, different intervals, just to express or to show how confident they are in the reliability of their results. And there are ways to actually calculate that. We're not gonna look at that too much. We're just kind of focusing on um, just what does that statement mean? So an example, let's interpret confidence interval. So we're gonna to go to um, an interactive. It is available in, in D2L as well. Um, in the interactive, the average is set to zero. So basically what they're looking for is set to zero or what they found is set to zero and the positives and negatives tell how far above or below the average a point may lie. The lines that show up represent each time a study is done. Okay. 
middle of the line is the average and the ends of the lines represents the ends of the confidence interval. The length of the line is the length of the confidence interval. So longer line, more confident. Lower line, less confident, um, or sorry, longer or shorter. So if we pull up that inter or that interactive, this is what we're looking at here. So we see our sample mean or the mean or the zero um, value in the middle. And every time we see a new point form, that is a new study that's being done. And the line that's showing up, that is the confidence interval. Right? So basically we're looking at does our study or is our study reliable? Is it going to give us the same Kind of average um, across all studies right, based on the confidence intervals. Right? So this is looking at a 95% confidence interval. So this is what it would look like. This is what we would be looking at. Right? The majority of um, our studies are falling in that kind of range. Right? So let's just look at what happens if we increase or decrease the confidence le level. Right? So we're at 95%. What happens if we increase it 99, 98. Well, you see that a lot more studies are falling um, within that. We can also see that the confidence interval lines are growing larger. Right? So the confidence intervals of the study, so the values, um, they're ensuring that they incorporate that sample mean a lot more. What happens if we decrease it? maybe we're 50% confident, right? Our interval lines are a lot shorter, right? There's more values or more, um, more values falling outside what we are finding or outside of what we would expect. So the reliability has gone down. So let's go back, keep it at 95. What happens if we increase the sample size? Let's make it 20. Right. Right, so if we're increasing the sample size, it looks like the confidence interval actually decreases. So the more samples we do, it decreases that margin of error. Right. Right. It's getting smaller and smaller because we have more samples or more studies that kind of allow us to ensure um, what those values are actually going to be. If we're going to decrease it, right, so decrease it, right, we can see our confidence intervals are getting larger. Right? So by getting larger, with fewer samples, we're maybe less confident, but our, con our interval is going to be larger to ensure that it kind of falls, everything falls within that range, right? So it kind of just shows um, what it will look like in terms of confidence intervals as well, the importance of having more and more samples, right? Or studies, right? The more studies you have, the more reliable or the smaller your margin of error will be. The larger um, or the less samples you have, the larger your margin of error has to be um, to ensure that it remains within that confidence level. So with that, right, with our margin of error, right, there's types of bias that come into play because there is some bias that could affect um, these results, uh, these values. So types of bias. So bias is when the sample of a population or the survey slash measurement tool has flaws that affect the conclusion of a study. So this could be um, something that affects that confidence interval or affects that reliability. Right? So we're looking at either the sample or the survey or measurement tool. And again, it has flaws that affect the conclusion. Right? So the, something that affects the results. And there are multiple types. So we're going to look at the different types and give an example of each just so we have an idea um, of them. So the first one is sampling bias. So sampling bias occurs when the sample does not accurately represent the population. The sample does not accurately represent the population, right? So that's going to affect the validity um, of it, right? So for example, you'd like to find out if something is true about students in your school and you ask the students in your English class, 
right? So just asking the students in your English class, class does not accurately represent the population of the school because you might only be looking at a specific grade, right? A specific demographic, um, right? Maybe it's a university level English or a college level English or an open uh, level English class, right? So that's going to affect um, how well that represents the population. Now, if you changed it to ask all, all English classes, that might be different, right? That might more accurately represent the population. Non-response bias. So again, this is focusing on the sample. So it's a type of sampling bias. And this is where the sample does not accurately represent the population. But in this case, it's because a particular or an important part of the population is missing. So it's whether they are unable or unwilling to participate, right? So it's you're actively excluding them um, or what you're doing is not allowing them to participate. So for example, you want to find out if something is true about the students in your school, you put out your survey when all grade nines are away on a field trip, right? So there, all the grade nines are unable to participate. So there's a non-response bias. Right? They're not able to respond. There's no response from that group um, of the population, which should be included in the sample. Measurement bias. Measurement bias is when there is a flaw in the measurement tool. Right? So for example, if we're looking at surveys, which we'll talk about later, surveys have been poorly designed. Right? So a poorly desi designed survey would be an example of a measurement bias. Right? You want to find if something is true about students in your school and you state your opinion on the survey before asking the question, right? So um, it might be something like, oh, you're trying to um, figure out what, what are the important, um, I don't know, what are the important characteristics of the school or what's important to um, you for learning and you go out and you say, oh, this survey is stupid. I don't like, I think it's the whole thing's a joke, right? I don't know why we're doing it, right? That might be measurement bias because you're kind of stating an opinion um, that might influence how they respond. Response bias. So this is a type of measurement bias where the survey respondents were influenced to to a certain way, often because the survey is not anonymous or because the respondent thought they had to answer in a certain way. So again, response is a type of measurement bias and respondents are influenced to a certain way, often because it's not anonymous, so people know how you're going to answer, they know what your answer is, or they thought they had to answer a certain way. Right? You want to find if something is true about students in your school, you go to each class and ask students to raise your hands if they agree. Right? So again, by raising your hand, it's not anonymous. I know exactly what you're going to answer. And in, the, in kind of a flip side, you may not want to answer in a certain way because people know it's going to be, it's your answer. Right? So maybe you adjust your answer um, to look through that. So as a little bit of practice, what I want you to do, there is an article in the online platform. It is a study um, by an author or an investigator. I don't know if I want to call him a scientist. Um, on 12 ch children that, that claim to prove the link between autism and vaccinations. Right? And as you're reading through it, I want you to think about what bias is, study is present in his study. So this is a controversial article because this is one that um, a lot of people reference in, in, in the argument between vaccinations and autism. Um, however, this article has since been redact, retracted and all the findings were determined to be falsified. Right? So as you're reading through it, think about, keep that in mind, everything that or all of his conclusions um, or the conclusions of the articles have been deemed false based on what he did um, or how he presented it or the methodology behind it um, or the way he kind of misused his findings, right? So keep that in mind. It is not to be taken um, as truth. It's been retracted, it stated that all over the article. But think about what bias is present in his study, right? Because he's going through and doing the study, regardless of what the results now right, are 
we understand them to be. Um, but he was able to present them in a way that gave him the argument he needed, right? So think about what bias is present in the study that allowed him to kind of manipulate the results or kind of force the results towards the conclusion that he wanted. So use that as practice um, as well. We have the article. So again, take a look through the article and see if you can go back and find those different um, types of bias because again that those are the types of bias that either they're intentionally done or they're unintentionally done um, and it just kind of comes up um, so try to find those biases or try to find things that kind of don't seem quite right um, in the articles to kind of force you to think about how people can manipulate or misuse data